It was January 7th in 1610 when Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei made an astonishing discovery using his homemade telescope. Four moons orbiting the planet Jupiter. By the way, these days you can make your own version of his telescope using cardboard tubes, lenses, and some super glue. The main point of this DIY telescope is to place two lenses at the correct distance from each other. You'll need two lenses. One lens should be concave, the other one convex. So one lens is curved out and the other one is curved in. Galileo's initial telescope was able to magnify objects approximately eight times. He continued to improve it until it reached about 20 times the magnifying power. But let's get back to the main story, shall we? When he first looked at those four moons of Jupiter, he believed he was simply looking at a bunch of stars. But he soon noticed that these space objects seemed to be moving in a regular pattern. It took him a couple of weeks to figure out that what he was looking at were not stars, but moons circling Jupiter. Galileo initially named those moons 1, 2, 3, and 4. But let's face it, those weren't the most creative names. As more moons in our galaxy were discovered later, the numerical system for naming them became confusing and impractical. So it lasted for just a few centuries. So, these days, those four satellites, Jupiter's largest, are named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They're collectively known as the Galilean moons to honor the man who first noticed them. Galileo's discovery was crucial for our later understanding of astronomy. It was initially believed that other objects revolved around the Earth since it was seen as the center of the universe. We now know that there are hundreds of moons in our solar system. However, large moons, like those discovered by Galileo Galilei, are not so commonly stumbled upon. A moon is considered large when it's the size of our planet or bigger. Ganymede, for instance, is bigger than Mercury. We basically call Ganymede a moon just because it orbits Jupiter. Otherwise, it has all the other characteristics of a planet. It's no surprise that Jupiter has the biggest moons in the area. It beats all the other planets in our solar system in both size and mass. So no wonder it pulled in a lot of other objects towards it. Jupiter is believed to have in total almost 80 moons, with only 53 of them being given official names until today. The first of those Jupiterian moons to be discovered by Galileo was Io. What sets it apart is the fact that it has a lot of volcanoes. Io is the only space object to have active volcanoes in our solar system, apart from Earth. It's also nicknamed the Moon of Fire and Ice because of its sulfur dioxide snowfields. Io's outer layer is splotchy, featuring multiple colors like orange, black, yellow, white, and red. That's probably the reason why NASA described it as a giant pizza covered with melted cheese and splotches of tomato and ripe olives. Because of that sulfur though, Io doesn't smell that appetizing, something similar to a rotten egg. There are more than 100 mountains on the surface of this moon. They are a lot larger than those we see on Earth, some being bigger than Mount Everest. On average, these mountains are 4 miles tall and 98 miles long. Because of those active volcanoes and the intense radiation on Io, there's little chance that life as we know it could exist here. But hey, who's to say it can't have life the way we don't know it? Next on the list of Galilean moons is Europa, the smallest of the four. It's comparable in size to the moon. Europa has an entirely icy surface, with just a bunch of craters scattered here and there. Because of that outer layer, Europa is very reflective, making it one of the brightest moons out there. As for its age, scientists believe its surface to be somewhere between 20 to 180 million years old. Europa is about 4.5 billion years old. What lies beneath that icy surface is impressive. It may even hold the secret to life outside Earth. Ice forms here in two ways. The first is through congelation, a rather self-explanatory process. Ice just grows as the surrounding environment gets colder and colder. 
The other method, though, is a lot more fascinating. A layer of supercooled water found under the ice shell reacts when agitated. It then generates these crystals that make it look like it's snowing in reverse, floating upwards to the ice sheet they sit under. You can recreate this environment yourself at home. Take a bottle of purified water and place it into the freezer. If you don't have purified water anywhere near, just boil some water a couple of times to get rid of as many impurities as possible. Since there won't be any particles inside, once in the freezer, it won't turn solid. But if you take the bottle out of the freezer and give it a shake, the impact will make the water rapidly crystallize, transforming it into a slush-like consistency. There may be water on Europa, but there's little evidence so far that life exists on this moon. However, it's one of the highest candidates in the solar system for potential habitability. Some sort of life forms could adapt to live there in its under ice ocean. That environment is most likely similar to what we can find in our planet's hydrothermal vents hidden deep within our oceans. The amount of oxygen in Europa's atmosphere is very little, but in 2013, NASA gave away some cool evidence. This yet again supports the theory that there is potential for life on this moon. It seems that Europa might be venting water into space. If this is confirmed by future observations, it could also mean that Europa is geologically active. It could also come in handy if we'd manage to study water sources one day. The largest of those Galilean moons is Ganymede. It's also the biggest moon in our solar system altogether. It's a low-density space object similar to Mercury in size, but having only half of its mass. However, Ganymede is the only moon out there to feature its own magnetic field. It's quite small though, and we can barely notice it from Earth since it's overshadowed by Jupiter's much more powerful magnetic field. Another cool aspect of Ganymede is that its atmosphere contains oxygen. Don't get too excited, it's not nearly enough to support any life forms living there. Back in December 2021, a 50-second audio clip was released, which was previously recorded by NASA's probe on its Ganymede flyby. For the inexperienced, the sounds were more similar to those of an old dial-up internet connection. But because of its quirky tunes, Ganymede was soon nicknamed Jupiter's Singing Moon. Finishing up the list of Galilean moons is Callisto, or the most heavily cratered object in our solar system. What's interesting about this moon is that its landscape has barely changed since it formed, and scientists are still debating why this is happening. Most other space objects go through loads of changes throughout their lifetimes because of events such as collisions with other objects, changes in orientation or speed, or chemical reactions happening on their surface. Callisto is also about the size of the planet Mercury, but it has a lower density. Jupiter's magnetic field has a lesser impact here, since Callisto is the furthest from the giant planet. Its surface is estimated to be a staggering 4 billion years old. As opposed to Io, Callisto is not geologically active, but scientists believe there might be an ocean hiding underneath the moon's surface, which may potentially harbor life. The fact that it's less impacted by Jupiter's magnetic field means that it features low levels of radiation. Given this suitable environment, we may one day end up setting a human base for future explorations here. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Uh-oh, hurricane alert! Everyone's hiding! The speed of the wind outside is more than 75 miles per hour. Seems like a lot, but this storm is moving at 400 miles per hour. Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but to see a storm that fast, you'll have to travel to Jupiter. So let the journey begin. The planet is huge. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this gas giant. It's also incredibly hot, with the temperatures reaching about 43,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the planet's core. Unfortunately, you can't land on Jupiter's surface because, well, being a gas giant, it doesn't have any solid surface. 
But you can go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. Look at these thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. They're what make the planet look colorful and kind of striped. If you continue descending toward the center of the planet, you'll see its atmosphere, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, becoming liquid. It happens because of immense atmospheric pressure. The planet's core itself is a mysterious object. Scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a molten ball of thick liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Anyway, exploring Jupiter isn't the main goal of your trip. No, you've arrived here to see the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is 1.3 times wider than our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm goes more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat reached 2,400 degrees. This temperature is higher than that of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear entirely. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The change in the wind speed is no more than 1.5 miles per hour during one Earth year. It's a tiny change, but however small the difference is, it still means a lot. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. It's unclear what fuels the storm. Can it be the nature of the storm's home planet? Since it's a gas giant, Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, so there's no friction which might be the only thing that could make the storm weaken. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, swirling. Just like on our home planet, where cooler and warmer air mix and merge into one another, forming giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms could have come together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps going by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, the storm might be absorbing other smaller vortices. This makes the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow astronomers to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Scientists have been speculating on what may hide beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Is it a massive volcano? Eh, unlikely. Jupiter is mostly made up of gases, and it doesn't have a crust that could crack, letting lava escape from the planet's interior. There are also a few theories explaining why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to bright orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies deep below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of gas might be reacting to the UV radiation coming from the sun. This is probably what gives the storm its red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Hey, your guess is as good as mine, huh? Jupiter isn't the only planet that can boast having a giant storm. Another one, as wide as our home planet, rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. How clever! 
The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so. The storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it starts stretching and stretching. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the top of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White Spot is where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal source of heat that can power the winds. Anyway, severe storms on different planets of the solar system aren't the only space mystery that makes astronomers scratch their heads. Let's move to Pluto, the largest known dwarf planet in the solar system, and explore its atmosphere. It rises really high above the surface of the planet and has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. By the way, our moon also has some sort of an atmosphere. Called an exosphere, it consists of helium, neon, and argon. It's 10 trillion times less dense than Earth's atmosphere. While traveling through space, watch out for black holes! Woo! A black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. But black holes can sometimes behave like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, they flare up. Sounds like me. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy. And this phenomenon leaves gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater this event left behind could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, I can't get my head around that either. During your space voyage, think twice before landing on unknown planets. Otherwise, you may end up in a place like K2-141b. That's a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate, form clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, it rains rocks. The surface of this exoplanet is covered with lava seas dozens of miles deep. The temperatures on the K2-141b reach 5,000 degrees during the day. That's toasty enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of 1 mile per second, carry this rock vapor into the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky rain. Uh Uh-uh, not a vacation spot. Too hot. I'll pass. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. It's staring at you, and you're staring at it. A giant eye that seems to be pulling you into an abyss. You're hovering over it in your space copter. But however scared you might be, you still need to do your job. So you send your copter down to the surface of the red planet. Right, that's where you are, on Mars. But first things first, you take a moment to remember everything you know about the fourth planet from the Sun. It's the last of the inner planets. Those are the planets that lie within the asteroid belt. They're also called terrestrial, since they're made up of rocks and metals. The atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than Earth's. It contains 95% carbon dioxide and a mere 1% of oxygen. In other words, don't even think about pulling off your helmet. Anyway, there's no time to waste. You land on the surface of the planet and find yourself in a brownish-red world. That's a good thing you're wearing a spacesuit. This place is freezing cold. The thermometer sewn into the sleeve of your suit shows minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Time to take your first step on the Martian surface. The planet looks quite colorful, and the hue of a particular area depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The ground under your feet is covered in fine dust. It looks like rust. The same orange dust is in the air. Good thing you have your own supply of oxygen and don't need to breathe Martian air. The layer of this dust covering the surface of Mars can be from 6 to 40 feet thick. You hope you'll avoid getting swallowed by some Martian quicksand. You start walking, feeling very light. Mars is just 15% of our planet's volume and a mere 11% of Earth's mass. 
It means that gravity here is much weaker. Its pull is 38% as strong as the pull of gravity on the surface of Earth. You jump up and down, and then try to run several hundred feet. Ha! <laughs> you haven't even broken a sweat! What makes it harder for you to explore the place on foot is that the planet's surface is rocky, covered with craters and volcanoes, old dry lake beds, and canyons. You see something huge towering on the horizon, but you try to suppress your curiosity. You'll have enough time to figure out what it is later. Suddenly, a massive cloud appears in the distance. It looks as if a huge herd of horses is approaching you. In reality, you better get back into your copter and fly away as fast as you can. That's one of Mars' infamous dust storms. They mostly occur during the summer in the southern hemisphere of the red planet. They can sometimes cover the entire planet. And you see the largest ones from Earth. You hop into your copter and set a course for the eye that scared you so much. Winding channels that look like veins run through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less it looks like an actual eye. Soon you realize it's a crater. It's giant, almost 19 miles across. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, there was Martian water in the enormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Now, remember that towering something on the horizon? It's time to go and explore it. When you come close, you realize it's the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which is almost the same size as the state of Arizona. You tilt your head. Wow! The mountain is 16 miles high. It's also rimmed by 4-mile-high cliffs. To picture the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, towering around 2.5 miles above sea level and stretching 75 miles across. Sounds impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. But why is this volcano so large? It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason might be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. It's static. You see, on our planet, the crust is made of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hot spots producing lava, new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth, and the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. So, how about getting closer to the enormous mountain? But once you step out of your copter on Martian soil, the ground under your feet starts shaking. Well, that's a Mars quake. But how can it happen if Mars doesn't have any actively shifting tectonic plates? Specialists from NASA are sure Mars quakes occur when energy inside the planet gets suddenly released. It leads to rock fractures and cracks in the planet's crust. Another powerful jolt and one of such cracks opens right next to you. You fall to the ground, afraid to move. But soon, everything calms down. You wait for a couple of minutes, just to be sure, and get up. Oh look! Here's a perfect opportunity to explore the insides of the red planet. The crack is large enough to send a special research robot. The planet's crust is thin and consists of volcanic basalt rock. The mantle that surrounds the core of the planet is made up of thick silicates, oxygen, and some minerals. You can probably compare it with soft, rocky toothpaste. Mars's mantle is also much thinner than Earth's. It's just 800 to 1100 miles thick. As for the planet's core, it's made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur and is between 900 and 1200 miles wide. This core doesn't move. That's why Mars doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field. Unfortunately, your drone is now lost in the depths of the red planet. You leave it there and continue your exploration. Your next destination is Valles Marineris, 
It sounds more like an Italian red sauce, but it's actually an enormous canyon, or rather a canyon system, that runs along Mars' equator. It's as awe-inspiring as Olympus Mons, more than 2,600 miles long and over 4 miles deep. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Now let's make another comparison. One of the most famous canyons on Earth is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But it's 10 times shorter and around 4 times less deep than this canyon on Mars. Some scientists think that Valles Marineris is the edge of an enormous tectonic plate. It moves so slowly that almost nothing has happened in that region over millions of years. And the movement of this plate probably began 3.5 billion years ago. Anyway, the only thing left on your today's to-do list is to visit Mars's moons. They're among the tiniest in the solar system. Phobos is the largest of the two. It orbits a mere 3,700 miles above the surface of Mars. There's no other known moon that travels closer to its mother planet. It whips around the red planet three times a day, while the second moon, Deimos, needs 30 hours to complete one orbit. Phobos is getting closer and closer to Mars, about 6 feet each 100 years. Within the next 50 million years, it'll either crash into the planet or break apart and form a ring. Happy but tired, you return to your spaceship. Tomorrow, you'll continue exploring the magnificent red planet. And who knows what discoveries are awaiting you. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.